So in this course, we're going to be talking about <clears throat> how common is prediabetes or insulin resistance or metabolic syndrome? Um, how, uh, how serious is it? How do you diagnose it? What do you do for it? Uh, but let's go back to that first comment. When I listed three things, prediabetes, insulin resistance, and metabolic syndrome, which one of these am I talking about? I've got a confession. Um, there were months, maybe years, as a young uh, medical student and doc that I really understood uh, the differences between these things, and I was thinking along the wrong path. I was thinking that there's got to be some sort of concrete, factual difference. That's not really what the difference is. The difference is how you approach it. You know, it's like the, the eight blind men and the elephant. If you approach it as a biochemist or a physician dealing with the biochemical issues, it's, pre uh, it's insulin resistance. If you approach it as a public health um, professional talking to a bunch of people out, out there who uh, are going to get disease and cost a lot of money and die, you tend to think of it as from the, the illness perspective, prediabetes. And if you're a doc, especially 10, 20 years ago, you kept seeing all of these patterns of signs and symptoms that correlated, but it wasn't too clear what was going on, what was causing them, what the impact was going to be. Uh, from that perspective, it was a syndrome. So let's go through this and, uh, and talk briefly about, about uh, the differences between those, those items and defining them. Um, as you see, I've got this, um, this image from Charles Piller in Science Magazine, uh, his editorial saying, uh, prediabetes is a dubious diagnosis. Again, I agreed with a lot of stuff he said, but there is major confusion here, and that is one of my key examples. He said there's no complications. Prediab all of these are the same thing, and they cause heart attack and stroke and eye damage, etc., but let's go back. Let's, let's go to the basic point. What is it? Well, again, as I said, they're all defining the same thing, but they're looking from different perspectives. If you're looking from a disease model, it's prediabetes. If you're looking from a biochemical model, it's insulin resistance. If you're looking from the clinical uh, model, meaning a doc looking at patients, a single patient trying to diagnose what's going on, uh, especially five, 10 years ago, before we understood it that well, it was metabolic syndrome. Um, <clears throat> as you see here, we've got multiple tests and multiple different expert organizations trying to define this because there's one thing, and most of us who work with this uh, issue of uh, insulin resistance, prediabetes, diabetes, call it the diabetes highway. In other words, there's really no, the only difference between prediabetes and diabetes is not the disease process, it's the same. The only difference is the degree. So again, different organizations, as you see here, have different definitions for the degree, and there are different types of tests, and these are just a couple of them. Um, briefly, the fasting glucose, uh, WHO, says 1 to 125. ADA says that as well. Um, and I would agree with... Uh, that definition. However, I warn my patients, once they start hitting the high 90s, they need to be looking at this. Two-hour glucose, they wait to 140 up to 200. Over 200, anytime, most organizations would say that's frank or frank means, in medical terminology, full-blown diabetes. Um, and the reality is, again, if you're looking for clear and pristine, perfect uh, carb metabolism, you really don't want to get over 120, even after a two-hour or 75-gram glucose challenge. So, again, maybe some more differences, but again, some, some clarifications. I mean, you get some patterns here. Uh, hemoglobin A1c is, again, um, a difference. You see the IEC, the International Expert Committee, says six and above. Um, 
ADA says 5.7 and above, and myself and a lot of others would say, look, anytime you get above five, you know this process is getting started. Um, both of these organizations stop at 6.4 because at 6.5 and higher, they say that's, again, frank or full-blown diabetes. So to get back from a review, we've got three different models depending on where you're coming from. We just covered the disease model. That's pre-diabetes. How about the second model, the biochemical model? As you see, um, <clears throat> this is what's going on. And this is the same disease, whether we're talking about type 2 diabetes, full-blown type 2 diabetes, or um, just insulin resistance, which is, uh, again, just the disease process at, at a certain degree or level. Type 1 diabetes is significantly different. Type 1 diabetes, you don't make insulin. Uh, the insulin, uh, the beta cells in the pancreas have been, have been damaged, and we think most of the time by our own body, we take uh, friendly fire. That's a whole different ball game. It's a whole different issue. Let's not complicate it and get too deep. Um, let's just make, uh, again, the overall clarification. Three different perspectives, disease model with prediabetes, biochemical model with insulin resistance, which we're talking about and then the clinical model. So the disease model we talked about was prediabetes, biochemical model, insulin resistance. Now let me just explain this real quick. This is a schematic for the, um, the cells of the body, mostly the muscle cells and the liver cells, because those are the ones that really are able to pull sugar out of the blood. You see high levels of sugar, over 120, and clearly over 140, begin to show some damage. We won't get into a lot of the types of damage that they cause, but Elevated hemoglobin A1C is, that's exactly what's going on. It's damage to hemoglobin because it's been, um, glucose has attached itself to that hemoglobin. So here's the cell, the muscle or liver cell usually, and they have receptors for insulin. When the blood sugar gets too high, that insulin is released and it uh, clicks on this um, insulin receptor. That insulin receptor trips a whole cascade of metabolic processes where blood sugar is, is, pull, sugar is pulled out of the blood and into the cell where you don't have that damage uh, associated with high blood sugar. Now, again, that's the two, pardon the repetition, but again, this is such a confusing item, that's why I'm doing the repetition. Three types of di uh, definitions of prediabetes or this process the disease model, prediabetes, which we covered first, the biochemical model, or insulin resistance, which we just covered, and then the final model is clinical. It's what a doctor sees. Now, you don't really hear the term metabolic syndrome quite so much anymore. And why is that? Well, first of all, let's define syndrome. A syndrome is a group of signs and symptoms that occur together and characterize a particular abnormality or condition. In other words, um, the doc really doesn't know totally what's going on. The doc is seeing uh, maybe some high blood pressure, some uh, low, uh, high, uh, low uh, HDL, some uh, belly obesity, some things like that. And they notice that, you know, these all tend to go along with people developing diabetes later on. One of the reasons, so back to why we don't hear that term metabolic syndrome very often anymore, we have defined insulin resistance or prediabetes so well at this point, it's a little bit, um, it's clearer to say prediabetes or insulin resistance. Metabolic syndrome, a syndrome again by definition is just a cluster of things. Now when I say cluster, uh, I mean that in <laughs> several, several senses of the word. Here's the mo one of the most simple clusters uh, defining metabolic syndrome. Visceral obesity, in other words, fat around the, um, the inside of the abdomen. Low HDL cholesterol, high triglycerides. Remember, we talked about that multiple times. When I look at a, a, um, a cholesterol test, that's exactly what I look for a high triglyceride over HDL ratio. Uh, insulin resistance, again, pardon that, but that's just 
part of the term that's being used to define this syndrome. And then high blood pressure. Now, that's, as I said, one of the more um, simple definitions. Docs noticed, again, when we were really talking a lot about metabolic syndrome 10 and 20 years ago, we also noticed that, you know what? It doesn't always have to have high blood pressure. And guess what? You really don't have to always have a lot of excess fat around your belly. At least on the outside, you might be skinny and have it on the inside. Um, I haven't done an MRI, so I don't know if I have a lot of um, fat around my uh, intestines on the inside, but I clearly don't have a lot of fat around my uh, waist. Um, since I went low carb a couple of years ago, I, I was always waist size 32, which is not huge. I mean, 33, which is not huge. Now it's 32. So again, not a lot of fat around there, but you don't have to have that to have, quote, metabolic syndrome. So again, as you see, this is part of the reason why we don't use metabolic syndrome anymore. It's just a cluster. <clears throat> Pardon the repetition on that too. And speaking of clusters, it gets deeper and deeper in terms of different things that can be included and different things that, that are not. Depending on who you talk to, what coding organization you're talking to, what World Health Organization, American Heart Association, ADA, uh, American Association of Clinical Endoc Endocrinologists, you know, it seems like everybody has a dog in this fight, and that's a mess. So again, now you see why I certainly don't use that term very often. I go back, my, my, my role, my goal is to help people understand this disease process, this meta biochemical process, what it does to them, and what to do about it. So again, so now we've defined, let's go back and do that real quick, one more repetition, three types of definitions. Prediabetes is more of the disease model. Pardon the, uh, pardon that. Um, the biochemical model is insulin resistance. And again, the clinical model, again, more of an old style term, uh, what doctors were seeing and trying to piece together metabolic syndrome. Just some real quick comments. Who cares? Well, the CDC cares. Uh, they say a, a third of Americans, adult, adults, have prediabetes. And nine, nine out of ten don't know it. Well, as we said before, Charles Pillar at Science Magazine would say, well, that doesn't matter because there's no complications associated with it. It's just a definition. Well, let's go back. And, and he also said CDC was a scaremonger. I am as well an ADA, the American Diabetes Association as well. I mean, I've got arguments with all of those groups and I'm, I'm sure they've got arguments with each other, but we all agree. Insulin resistance or prediabetes is serious. As the CDC would say, look, well, let me give you my perspective first. It causes plaque, cardiovascular inflammation, uh, risk for heart attack and stroke. One third of retinopathy is present at the diagnosis of type two diabetes, which means one third of retinopathy got started during prediabetes. In other words, wherever you've got arteries, you're getting damage. Um, and as Dale uh, Bredesen would say, maybe all of Alzheimer's has at least part of it, maybe most of it, maybe all of it, caused by prediabetes or insulin resistance. Here's a, a quote and an image from the CDC saying, uh, prediabetes is a serious health condition. It's where your blood sugar is elevated. Um, and it sets you up for increased risk for developing type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and stroke, retinopathy. This is a quote from the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. They're just trying to take care of patients. And as you see down here, they say um, diabetic retinopathy is the leading cause of blindness in the United States. About 30% of newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes patients already have evidence of diabetic retinopathy. So uh, it's a very serious disease, no matter what you call it, metabolic syndrome, uh, prediabetes, or insulin resistance. Thank you again for your interest in this course, and we'll cover some, uh, in, in later videos, we'll cover um, how prevalent it is, and um, how to diagnose it, and what to do about it.